Hi, I'm Ken Jacobson, Senior Documentary Programmer, AFI Festivals, and I want to welcome you to AFI Fest 2020, presented by Audi, and to this Q&A for The New Corporation, The Unfortunately Necessary Sequel, directed by Joel Bakken and Jennifer Abbott. First, I want to thank our supporters of the festival, our presenting sponsor, Audi, our AFI members, of course, you, our audience. The new corporation, the unfortunately necessary sequel, had its world premiere just very recently at the Toronto International Film Festival, and we're thrilled to be presenting the U.S. premiere of the film at AFI Fest. We're equally thrilled today to have with us the directors Jennifer Abbott and Joel Bakken. Joel Bakken teaches law at the University of British Columbia. His critically acclaimed book, The Corporation, was an international bestseller and inspired the award-winning documentary, The Corporation, which he wrote and co-created. Joel's sequel book, The New Corporation, How Good Corporations Are Bad for Democracy, good is in quotes, was recently released in North America. Jennifer Abbott is a Sundance award-winning director who makes films about the most urgent issues of our time. She is co-director and editor of the 2003 documentary, The Corporation, and director of the new film, The Magnitude of All Things. Jennifer is a single mother of three living on the West Coast. Welcome Joel and Jennifer. Thank you both for being here and congratulations on the film. Thank you so much for having the film in your festival and for having us on today. Absolutely. So let's go back to the beginning, if we can, uh, to, to Joel, to your earlier book, The Corporation, The Pathological Pursuit of Profit and Power, which came out in 2003, uh, I believe, and the, the documentary, The Corporation. Yeah, the, the book and the film, you know, clearly resonated with lots of people. You know, what, what were some telling moments for you during that process that signaled, you know, we've really touched a chord here. We're, we're really on to something. Well, I think uh, as the book and, and the film rolled out, um, what the main kind of insight that audiences seem to have and seem to take from it was this idea that corporations aren't somehow these things that are part of nature, that are fungible and can do anything they want, but that they are in fact legal institutions created by governments and imbued with certain characteristics um, like personhood, for example. And the idea that the law actually requires as part of their character that corporations always and only pursue their own self-interest. So that regardless of how nice the CEO is or, or how good the images are that are put on our television screens and our computer screens, the fundamental reality is that legally and institutionally, a corporation has to prioritize its self-interest above social interests, above environmental interests. And I think that was a real, um, that was real insight uh, for a lot of people who were, who were watching this film and, and reading the book. Fast forwarding a bit from that time, uh... When, when did you realize, you know, there's been a, a change, a, a significant evolution in, in the corporation and in its path, psychopathic ways? Uh, and, you know, we need to revisit this. It, that, that moment actually happened at two different times for Joel and I, interestingly. For myself, of course, I observed all of the, the problems that we explored in the first film just getting exponentially worse and worse with time, which was obviously um, very disheartening. But I wasn't actually really called to make the sequel the way Joel was earlier on, um, partly because I co-directed and edited the first film and, and that was cut from 400 hours of footage. And, you know, did I want to go back and, and wrestle another monster of a film like that to the ground? Not particularly. Um, but for me, everything changed when Trump was elected. And it's not as if really that much changed instantly on a deep level, but rather 
the veil was taken down. There was no longer the pretense that corporations and uh, government were acting independently. Uh, they were now rigging the system in plain view. And for me, it was that moment that I felt um, there were really compelling reasons uh, to make the sequel. Yeah, and I mean, I would just add that for me, it, it happened while I was sitting at the 10th anniversary screening of the original film. And I looked around and I realized that everything we had looked at, whether it's the crisis in democracy, the environment, climate change, inequality, racial inequality, economic inequality, all of these issues had gotten worse. Corporations had become more powerful. They gained more authority over society and over governments. And at the same time, they were presenting themselves as having in a way remedied the problem we identified. It was as though they were saying, we're no longer psychopaths, we're the good guys now. We're gonna solve your problems rather than create them. So it was that contradiction between on the one hand, corporations seeming to cause more problems in the world and on the other presenting themselves as though they were solving all those problems that kind of just hit me uh, in the head. And, and I thought, well, we, we really have to go back to the drawing board here. and. Uh, and create a sequel. And that was around 2013. Regarding this idea of the charm offensive and corporate social responsibility, why do you think there hasn't been more accountability around that? I mean, you'll read articles, you know, Amazon pledges $2 billion to fight climate change, you know, and we're gonna have 100% of our energy coming from renewables by 2025, et cetera, et cetera. And then you don't really hear much follow-up about that, those announcements. What, where's yeah. the accountability in that? I think, you know, we can look at that historically because, you know, for the last 40 years with the rise of neoliberalism, there's been a very concerted effort for us to distrust government, to, um, believe, in, to, to believe in markets, so there, I think there's like this huge ideolo ideological shift that we can see happening over the last several decades, which sort of predisposes ourselves not to question the actions of big corporations the way really we should be. And instead, you know, there's been this uh, critique of government and in some ways, in many ways, an assault on government um, of course, we need to hold our governments accountable without question, but it seems to me that there's a whole ideological apparatus that has really, um, made, let's say, deconstructed a critical uh, orientation towards the corporation, which has largely been in their favor. Yeah, and I think I would add to that, you know, the, the short answer to the question is why are corporations not truly socially responsible? It's because they're not made to be that. Corporations are designed by law to serve the interests of their shareholders uh, primarily. And so to the extent they are socially responsible, it can only be in ways that will help them generate wealth for their shareholders. And that is a profound limitation. So, I, you know, I don't blame the people who run corporations or who work for them. It's the institution itself that's doing this. It's like asking a lawnmower to make your smoothie in the morning or to give you a haircut. We wouldn't do that. That's not what lawnmowers are designed to do. They're designed to mow your lawn. And it actually becomes really dangerous, I think. Well, I certainly wouldn't want to get a haircut from a lawnmower. I mean, that would be a very dangerous thing. And so, so I think it's, it really is a matter of institutional uh, design and, and that we've, we've kind of lost sight of that. And that's part of the reason for, for this film and this book. Mm -hmm. And yet you have people like Lord John Brown, who you, know, you have in the film. And I, I thought you know, it was very effective the way you um, you know, showed what he has had to say over the years um, about corporate social responsibility, but then really looking at his actions uh, as CEO and that there really, you know, is a huge contradiction there. I guess I'm just curious in those interviews with people like Brown, you know, what kind of response do you get when you 
sort of push back on on what on the hypocrisy of what he's saying. I mean, the hypocrisy is clear from the film, but I'm just curious in his own words, does doesn't he see the hypocrisy? He doesn't seem to. Well, I mean, if I can just just jump in quickly here and then you know, Jen can add to it. When I was interviewing Brown, I really felt that he was absolutely sincere in what he was saying. And in, in my book, what I suggest is I actually don't think it is hypocrisy. I think in some ways it's more dangerous than hypocrisy. It's that what happens to somebody like Lord John Brown is he genuinely does believe in safety, but he also knows that his job as CEO is to grow his company and to make profits and to generate wealth for his shareholders. And so he starts to see safety as something that has to fit within those constraints. And then he forgets that there might be more to safety. So whether it's safety, sustainability, human rights, any of those things, what happens within the corporate mindset is those get tailored down to cohere with the fundamental mission of the corporation. And I don't think people like Lord John Brown or Jamie Dimon or any of these other heads of companies are being insincere. I think they genuinely believe in what they're saying. And, and have kind of unconsciously adopted the constraints in which they have to understand those things. And, and in a way that's worse or more dangerous than hypocrisy. It, it goes along with them uh, it, in terms of the psycho, psychopathic model, I, I would say. So um, I'm just curious, you know, Jennifer, you know, maybe starting with you, you know, there's, you, you alluded to this earlier uh, about the immense challenge of editing and co-directing the first film, you know, what, what are some of your challenges in take, and this is for both of you really, taking, you know, Joel's books and turning them into um, what are, you know, dense, but very watchable, uh, you know, and engaging films. Sure, I, I think, first of all, I have to um, do a shout out for our editor of this, the new corporation, Peter Rowick. I didn't, hallelujah, I didn't edit this one. <laughs> um, I think, you know, obviously with the corporation, one of the biggest challenges is that it's almost everywhere. And, and that includes inside our bodies and outer space and, you know, just infiltrating into every little crevice. And it's, it, therefore, it's very difficult to, to figure out what not to include. Mm. Uh, for myself, I mean, I really specialize in essay documentaries. And I think another very big challenge of, of essay documentaries is they, they start with ideas and you have to sort of find ways to cinematically represent those ideas through stories. And so uh, I think that was a huge challenge for, for both films, without question. Uh, and you know, for me, the, the biggest challenge always with a documentary is finding that narrative arc, both in terms of content, but also the emotional curve. Of, so that, and I, I really do um, create those emotional curves very similarly to how one might create them for a feature film, a feature narrative film. And it's always quite torturous and difficult to find that arc. Uh, and then once you do, then it becomes really fun, right? Like then it's almost, okay, now we can start playing with making this beautiful. Uh, and so, so I'll just cite that as for me, the, the biggest challenge. Yeah, I, I, I agree with all of that. And added to that challenge was the fact that the world kept happening as we were making the film. So we'd finished the film and then COVID uh, hit the shores of North America. We finished the film again, and then George Floyd was brutally killed by police. And each of those times we had to break the lock on the film, go back in and ask ourselves, how are these momentous events connected to our story? And how, how, do, we, how do we weave them uh, into the film that we'd already thought we'd finished. Um, so, so yeah, the usual narrative challenges of, of making a film about everything, but finding a realistic through line, emotional and story-wise, and then dealing with a world that just wouldn't stop happening. Yeah, that was actually gonna be my next question, asking about how the coronavirus and the social unrest uh, following George Floyd's murder, um, you know, affected your production process and 
and also, you know, maybe more important, the, affected the very issues that you were grappling with in, in the film. You know, in what ways did, did those events maybe intensify the points that you were already making? Um, and perhaps um, in what ways did they transform, you know, your thinking in it, if, if they did in any way? Well, they did without question. And Joel and I both felt so strongly that we had to open up, you know, we had to break picture lock to include them. And it's not as if we were making a current events film. We, we wouldn't have done so unless they were like, these were momentous moments that, I mean, with the, vi with the, the virus, of course, it laid bare the injustices of the system. And uh, to not include that would have almost rendered the film irrelevant, you know, out of date before it was released. Uh, as well, very important point with the coronavirus is uh, often neglected, I find, and very important for us to include the, the relationship between these emerging diseases and, uh, and the destruction of nature and its link to corporate capitalism. So very important that we make that point in the film. And thirdly, on a more hopeful note, uh, you know, it was a real model for the world to see how humans, humans can come together in communities, support each other, be altruistic, and, and put the economy second to public health. So it was very, you know, we wanted to include that hopeful element that really challenges the neoliberal idea of who we are, simply consumers, me first, individualistic, competitive. And then, you know, with the, with the uprising after George Floyd's brutal murder, of course, I can let Joel speak to that more, but, but um, you know, it was a challenge to the system it was a, it was, and it, you know, it's the biggest social movement in the United States. I think people are saying ever, if I'm not mistaken, just in terms of sheer numbers, I might be mistaken there, but I think I've heard that now and then. And I kind of go, really, is that, is that true? So, so it, it was, um, it was so powerful and so effective and so on the side of justice to start to make these links between um, racism, slavery, colonialism, and capitalism. And so, uh, of course, it, it provided um, a very authentically hopeful end to our film. And so that was essential as well. Anything to add to that, Joel? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it was important in particular, I, I agree with everything that, that Jen says, um, and it was important in particular with respect to the uprising after George Floyd's police killing. Um, it was really important to, to identify how that linked to broader themes of economic injustice, how racial and economic injustice are totally intertwined how in the United States and other countries as well, capital was originally pr produced as a result of slave labor, as a result of dispossession of indigenous people from their lands, as a result of exploitative work conditions for migrants. Um, so in all of these different ways, the production of capital itself by corporations and banks historically uh, was based on these institutionally racist structures. And that same money that was produced in the 1830s and the 1730s provided, in effect, the seed for modern day capital. There, there's never a sort of broken chain. So the money that's now in the hands of major US corporations or European corporations, Canadian, UK corporations, can't help but be linked back to those pools of capital that were created out of brutal systemic racist injustice. And, and that's part of how we try to, to deal with it in the film and the book. Yeah, well, I, for people who may not be aware, you know, once you're picture locked to, uh, to go back in and shoot more um, is a huge decision for any film team. You know, you are geared up to hit that finish line and have the resources to do that and the, and the capacity to do it. Um, and then to reopen the production and do that uh, once, let alone twice, is a huge undertaking. So um, I have to say, you know, I just want to really commend you both and the whole team for doing that. And 
I totally agree that it wasn't just to update us on current events, but it was absolutely intrinsic to the film you were making. And I think, you know, the, the proof of that for me is I had seen an earlier cut uh, without the George Floyd sequence. And when I saw the final version today with that sequence in it, it just worked so seamlessly. Uh, and there's a reason for that. It's because mm -hmm. it simply deepened the themes and the um, analysis that was already there. Um, so bravo. It's wonderful to hear that. <laughs> um, I wanna ask about uh, big tech for a minute. Um, you know, which is covered in the film. Um, and it feels like we might be a kind of a tipping point with big tech and with people's relationship to it. You know, I mean, there's a lot of frustration simmering uh, throughout the land about big tech. Um, and yet uh, they're very resilient. They're flush with cash. They have their hands deep in the pockets of our political system. Um, and, you know, honestly, millions of us are dependent to one extent or another on the services that they're getting from big tech. Where do you think we are with this relationship? And you, do you see a fundamental shift coming anytime soon? Well, I think it's a crossroads, similar to how we're at a crossroads in so many instances, right? So uh, are we going, you know, climate change, climate complete catastrophe, four degree world, you know, similarly in all, I think that, the extreme existential problems we explore are just at this crossroads and similarly with big tech. I mean, in some ways for me, big tech is almost as much of a insalvageable problem as the climate crisis in the sense that the outsized power is just so much. It's so huge in comparison to government and government's ability to rein them in and to regulate them. It's a, it, it's a little bit difficult to see how the pendulum can swing back in favor of, of being able to actually control them. And I think that's, um, control is a very important word when we speak about big tech because, and we make this point at, in, in the film that, you know, it, yes, it is about privacy, but ultimately it's about control. And it's about big tech having outsized power, influencing government in, in ways that are impacting our lives so that as um, Anand Gurdas says, you know, they may be, end up governing us, right? Through the profit motive, not, and obviously there's, democracy is nowhere to be seen if, we in that direction. So I think we are at a very important place with regards to high tech and it's going to take a huge amount of pressure and political pressure on government and political will to, um, to rein them in so that they serve us as opposed to the other way around. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, Stacey Mitchell in our film says, and here we are, you know, on Zoom, right? I mean, able <laughs> to have this meeting. Um, Stacey Mitchell says technology is, is, is a wonderful thing. The, the problem is when you have three or four behemoth corporations that are the gatekeepers and running the whole thing. And, you know, I think if you go back to 1911, the Supreme Court in the United States broke up Standard Oil. There, there are pieces of legislation, the Sherman Act, for example, that still exist in the United States, but around that that are about breaking up monopolies but around 1980 along with all the other deregulation trends um courts and and governments started to not enforce those laws anymore and there was a kind of sense that big is better and this went through you know the bush administrations it went through clinton it went through obama this was kind of the consensus among policymakers that big is better and it was only in that environment that these big companies like Google, like Amazon, were able to become what they are and use their kind of network effects to get bigger and bigger and, and ultimately monopolize their sectors and then start going beyond their sectors like Amazon into grocery or Facebook into news or whatever it is or Apple into health. So this is something, I mean, let's not forget 
Corporations are created by government, they're enabled by government, and they're regulated by government. It would be the easiest thing, technically, to simply break up Google in the same way that the Supreme Court broke up Standard Oil uh, back in 1911. The question, as Jen pointed out, it's really about political will. And it's really about understanding that it's we the people who should be in charge. Uh, but, but we've kind of lost that understanding. And we see these as these, these huge things that we can't even challenge. Well, they're totally dependent on us. They're totally dependent on the governments that we elect, enabling them, creating them, and allowing them to do what they do. Um, and so I think that's a lesson that that's part of what we're trying to show in this film is that we need to re-energize democracy and make it the work, work the way that it's supposed to work. So unfortunately, we're running short on time. I have m many other questions I want to ask you, but I think by way of uh, a final question, you know, you cover a lot of ground in the film and very effectively, I would add. Um, but if I could ask you to, you know, boil things down to maybe one cautionary note related to the new corporation and perhaps one positive uh, trend that you see, what, what would that, and, uh, and you could relate that even to a prescriptive action that, that people can take to make a difference. Well, I, I suppose cautionary for me is what I was saying earlier, that we really are at this a moment in time that is so important, it can't be overstated. You know, the upcoming election, obviously, which way it goes is, is going to determine a lot. But, you know, are we going to save ourselves from a four degree uninhabitable world? You know, are we going to save ourselves from the outsized power of high tech? Are we going to increase the disparities between rich and poor? Or are we finally going to address those injustices that are sometimes based in race and gender and other things? So it's just such a critical, important moment in time. And, and that might make people lose hope. But I think sometimes you have to kind of face the truth, you know, that truth being qualified. You have to face the truth and, and just still find the, the, the courage to get up and do everything you can to, to, to bend um, the arc of history towards justice. So you know, that's more cautionary. And, and I think on a hopeful note for me, well, of course, the uprising after George Floyd's murder, you know, it just shows up. Some, one interviewer asked, you know, how come they allowed that, right? And I, we're like, they didn't allow that, right? No, but no, the authorities did not allow the uprising, right? The uprising is beyond their control. So for me, the uprising is so hopeful because of just, it's this mass movement that's challenging the system, that's being effective, and that's clearly on the side of justice. And it's just, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's exactly what we needed right now to, to uh, show us that, you know, all of these institutions are socially constructed and therefore they can be reconstructed in a more just, compassionate way that hopefully will, will make a, a livable future. Yeah, I would say my cautionary note is to, uh, to that we need to understand that it's not a matter of sort of vilifying corporations, vilifying the people in corporations. It's a matter of understanding the limits of what corporations can do and being very skeptical, not cynical, but skeptical of their claims to be able to lead us to a more just or a better climate or, or socially or, or whatever. We have to understand that that's not what they do primarily. And, and, and so we have to look to other places for uh, proper leadership on social and environmental uh, and political issues. And I think that means within our current structure, that means our democratic institutions. And so we need to reclaim those democratic institutions. And I guess the hopeful note is that in many ways people are, and in many places people are. And that's what we try to show at the end of our film that we're, we're, having, we're having uprisings, we're having people in the streets, we're having protests, demonstrations, but we're also having people 
moving into government with with sort of uh, social justice, environmental agendas and saying that we're not going to give up on government. We're going to actually try to make it th work the way that it's supposed to work. And, and in terms of what people should do, I just think really try to under, understand that place that we're in, that we can't look to these large corporations to take us to a better world, that we need to be looking to democratic institutions. And therefore we need to think individually in our own lives, how can we be a part of that? What do we need to do to be democratic citizens? Well, how do we, how do we, how do we acquit ourselves of our responsibilities, not just our rights, but our responsibilities as democratic citizens. And just if people walk out of the film and ask that question of themselves and really try seriously to think about what it means, uh, I will be happy. Great. Well, I'm happy that we were able to spend this time with both of you. Congratulations, Joel and Jennifer on the film. Thanks again for being here. And to our audience, please do uh, tell your friends about the film so they can Check it out on our platform, hashtag AFI Fest, if you want to talk about the film. Um, and you can find other films at fest.afi.com. Thanks again, Joel and Jennifer, and best of luck with the film going forward. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, for watching.